Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate y'all uh, coming, uh, coming out so early in the morning. So uh, I will try to keep you awake and uh, informed and maybe a little entertained. And uh, uh, hopefully I'll be able to uh, share some things with you today that uh, you can use in this effort. And I want to really congratulate you and the university and the leadership on, on putting together this uh, YPOD effort. Um, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some of these ideas back to my university and say, well, why don't you people have any vision? And uh, you know, why don't, why don't you uh, use some of the strengths that we already have here and, uh, and uh, work on this issue uh, a little bit better? Um, so um, let's see. Uh, uh, maybe uh, a little bit of background. I have a, a pretty good history um, with pediatrics. I was um, brought to San Diego uh, by a pediatrician, uh, Phil Nader. And I, I worked in the pediatrics department uh, at UCSD for uh, six or seven years. And uh, that was really a, a, a fun time uh, because we, uh, it really started my interest in research in uh, children, and uh, which I've continued off and on through the years. Uh, so uh, I'm not really going to talk about um, uh, only uh, our work. I'm going to try to give you an overview of the literature um, uh, and the, some of the ideas about uh, obesity prevention and physical activity promotion um, by uh, working with environments and policies. So let, let me get started here. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to give you any obesity statistics. Everybody knows that it's an epidemic. It's, uh, you know, the rates of uh, childhood uh, overweight and obesity have tripled, quadrupled, uh, depending on the age group over the past few years. I'm, I'm really going to focus mainly on uh, physical activity and say, you know, um, as you know, the, a child's first step is, a, is one of the great days um, of the child's life and the parent's life. Um, but that joy doesn't last very long. Uh, because what happens um, after that is uh, the child starts hearing this mantra of, uh, would you please sit down and be quiet? Um, and uh, that kind of sets the pattern of declining physical activity throughout all of life. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit of that. Uh, but I, I do want to give a little bit of uh, prevalence data about, uh, about physical activity. So up until recently, um, we had little or no physical activity prevalence data on young people. And what we did have uh, comes from the, the YRBS Youth Risk uh, Behavior uh, Survey. Um, and since they uh, changed the uh, change, and I would say improved, the questions in the recent past, we, we don't really have good uh, trend data. And we only have any data on uh, adolescents. And so what you see here doesn't really look very good uh, because um, here for girls, uh, you got at most 30% of girls me uh, meeting the physical activity guidelines. And I, I want to make sure you, you know that the, the guidelines for youth is a minimum of 60 minutes per day um, for at least five days a week which is different from the 30 minute per day guideline for adults. So uh, you know, I, I don't want to get into too much of the details of that. If you want to discuss it, we can. Um, and then for boys, kind of a maximum of about 45% of adolescents, and this is high school kids, uh, meeting these guidelines, or at least saying they're meeting the guidelines. So, and as, as always, um, uh, no matter what the measure, we see that boys are more active than girls. And you see this um, uh, disturbing trend of whites being more active than uh, other racial and ethnic groups. Um, and so, uh, so this is what we knew about the prevalence of physical activity. The majority, um, the vast majority uh, of girls especially, not meeting the guidelines. Well, it turns out um, that um, in 2003-2004, the NHANES uh, national study um, uh, used 
for the first time, uh, objective measures of physical activity across the whole population. So they used accelerometers. And if you're not familiar with them, they're, they're small devices like this, kind of like a size of a pager. And you wear them on the waist. And it tells you the intensity of movement for every minute of the day. So you can, you can estimate from that the number of minutes of physical activity um, that a person's getting every day. So we're getting, and, and they had them wear them for uh, seven days. So then what we see, so remember these kind of 30 to 40, 45% uh, meeting guidelines. Well, look, look what happens when you, when you measure uh, uh, these um, uh, physical activity objectively. So if we think of uh, you know, uh, the uh, comparable age group, let's say, let's say 16 to 19, instead of 30 to 45% meeting guidelines, we're getting 5 to 10% meeting guidelines. Right? So when, when you actually measure uh, the behavior, it's a little bit different. Uh, from asking what, uh, what kids are doing. And uh, of course, at all ages, you're seeing boys are more active than girls. But look at, look at the age decline. Look at this. So the, in the best case, we've got six-year-olds, um, uh, less, still less than 50% um, of boys and only 35% of girls meeting the guidelines. And then as you get into middle school ages, it drops dramatically. And, uh, and really stays there uh, during the high school years. So, um, so we've got basically, it, it looks like here, um, a very few adolescents meeting uh, physical activity guidelines, and even the majority of children not meeting physical activity guidelines. So, uh, you know, since we have uh, evidence that physical activity is good for kids, physical health and mental health, I think uh, 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 that interventions are needed. And uh, I, I'll just show you this. Uh, when, you, when you look uh, by ethnic group, you see this very interesting uh, reversal, um, that in the self-reported, the whites were most active. But in the, uh, with the objective measures, interestingly, the whites are uh, among the least active. So uh, that, that is surprising. We, we've never seen this pattern before. But then we've never had real objective data before. And so this is uh, girls. And you see basically uh, the same pattern with boys. All right. So, um, so it's an int interesting kind of a reverse uh, disparity um, uh, when you look at the uh, objective data. So uh, that's just a little background uh, to make the point that interventions are needed, because we've got the, the vast majority of, of uh, youth, whether it measured self-report or objectively, uh, uh, showing a need for change. And uh, what I want to cover today is um, three general areas. I want to uh, uh, talk about uh, selected school policies and environmental uh, changes that might be effective in promoting uh, activity, uh, give you an overview of the uh, information on recreation environments and how that might help kids uh, be active, and then neighborhood design. So this is a slice of uh, the comprehensive uh, types of interventions that most of us believe are going to be needed to get many more kids physically active. Um, and, uh, and certainly uh, as recommended by the Institute of Medicine Preventing Childhood Obesity. So if you're interested in preventing childhood obesity and you have not uh, read or consulted the, um, uh, the Institute of Medicine report, I think it was 2004, 2005, you really should because it's really the best um, uh, blueprint for what needs to be done. And uh, I think a, a really excellent uh, 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 approach. Um, now, um, I uh, have been uh, using and promoting uh, what we call ecological models of behavior for quite some time. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm a behavioral uh, psychologist by training. Um, and so we have to use uh, all kinds of theories to help understand behaviors. Um, but most of the theories that we've been using for uh, decades 
um, are really about psychological and social factors. And, and we've learned a lot about that and that you, you can educate people uh, and, and uh, teach them skills to be active and, and provide social support, and that's somewhat effective. But it's not very effective. Um, and the, but the models stop there. So ecological models, let me just uh, uh, give you the, the simple picture, um, uh, show that behavior is affected uh, by multiple levels of influences. Um, from the personal, the biological, psychological, yes, those are important. The social environment of peers and family uh, um, is important. Um, the community uh, level is important, but also the physical environment. And the basic idea here is that uh, you, you, you're physically active in specific places. And some places are better than others. And so, for example, in a classroom setting like we are now, it's not really made for physical activity, is it? And guess how many of us are physically active? One. Just me. I get to, I get to walk around. Um, if we were in a park, Hopefully, you would find more people being physically active. Um, or in a gymnasium. Some places are made for activity. So if um, you find that you, uh, uh, there is a deficit of places to be uh, active, you know, we figure, well, that might affect your physical activity. And so we're trying to understand how can we design and engineer environments um, to help people children, adolescents in this case, be physically active. And um, you know, how do you create environments? Well, it's really policies. There's, uh, you know, there's policies that affect design of buildings, that affect where, how many parks there are and where they're, uh, where they're located, that uh, affect whether you're going to put sidewalks on streets, et cetera. And so uh, uh, to change policy, I mean to change environments, you have to understand policy. And there's other policies that can, uh, uh, that can affect physical activity too. So uh, you have to use these ecological models to uh, force you to think about multiple levels. And so uh, and as, as clinicians, you're, you're usually focusing on the individual. Uh, either on their, their physiology or their behavior or maybe their, uh, their social circle and their family. Um, but the solutions to physical inactivity, to poor diet, to uh, obesity and diabetes um, need to go beyond the individual. The, yes, we have to work with individuals too, but we can't neglect the larger environment and context. And so that's what... Uh, uh, ecological models are about. Mm. Uh, so, um, uh, so what that says is that uh, to be effective, interventions need to change psychological, social, and environmental and policy factors. So that's where we're heading. And uh, that's, uh, I think, uh, uh, probably already is a focus of your YPOD initiative. Um, and so, uh, what in thinking about physical activity, then what we would want to do is to identify the settings where activity or sedentary behaviors take place. Um, and we'll talk mainly about physical activity because that's where most of the data are, but certainly sedentary behaviors also are important. And uh, just looking at the uh, correlational data, um, uh, in, my v in my reading, the, uh, the, the, the link between sedentary behaviors and obesity risk is more consistent um, in the literature than the link between physical activity and obesity. You know, both are important, but uh, we usually talk about activity, but we need to expand our focus to sedentary behavior. So uh, we, we want to identify settings, and then we want to uh, provide opportunities and incentives uh, for kids to be active in those settings, and then reduce opportunities for sedentary behavior, and then educate and motivate uh, young people and their families to choose active options. And uh, let me, I, I want to um, uh, just briefly tell you uh, why uh, uh, I have begun to focus on 
uh, uh, the environmental and policy approach. And it started when I was um, working at UCSD in the pediatrics department. We had a, a project of educating families um, about how to be physically active, how to have healthier diets. And most of these families were uh, uh, lower to uh, middle uh, socioeconomic status. Ha over half of them were Mexican American. And uh, so we had this wonderfully theoretically based intervention. And we said, well, as part of understanding the population, um, we should uh, understand where they live. So we did uh, a systematic survey of the, uh, the, the food stores that were available in their neighborhoods, as well as a, a survey of parks um, and kind of activity settings in the neighborhoods. And one of the things that we found was, that was very striking, in the lower income neighborhoods, um, the, there were very few food stores, and the ones that there were tended to be liquor stores or convenience stores or very small markets. And when we did our inventory looking for the healthy, uh, healthy foods, we found very few of them. So um, it, it, it got me to thinking, well, how is our educational and motivational intervention uh, to, to have them change their diet going to be effective when they don't even have access to healthy foods? How are they going to act on their motivation? And uh, so it occurred to me uh, very belatedly that the environment can prevent people uh, very effectively from doing the thing, the healthy behaviors that they want to do. And if you think about it in the physical activity sense, yes, there were parks in a lot of the low income neighborhoods, but they were parks that were not well maintained, that didn't have a lot of the uh, um, you know, uh, play equipment that you would want for children. And uh, many of the streets did not have sidewalks and, and there was a lot of busy traffic and not safe crossings. So there were these environmental barriers uh, to physical activity that made the parents not want to let their kids go out and play. So uh, it wasn't then at the end of this project that surprising to, to uh, find out, well, we didn't really have much impact. So the, inter, the educational intervention didn't work because it couldn't work. And uh, so um, we, that has led me to say, first, what we need to do is provide opportunities and incentives uh, for people to be active um, and to eat better, make sure that they have those opportunities, then educate them and motivate them to take advantage of those opportunities. So I, the way I feel, we need to work on the environment and policy first so the educational interventions can be effective. And I'm sure that in your practices, you have run across similar kinds of issues and frustrations of trying to work with people um, and get them to do things that their environments prevent them from doing. Okay, so that is the, uh, that is the basis of uh, my approach here. So let's, let's get into some of the uh, more specifics. So what is uh, active living? Um, and uh, we, we try to uh, broaden the concept of physical activity here. And it's not just leisure time activity. It's also uh, looking at opportunities for bringing transportation activity back into uh, daily routines. Um, occupational activity is not so relevant for kids, uh, although you may think of school as their occupation, so that's relevant. And then household uh, um, uh, activity. And, uh, and, f and, and of course, we don't think of um, uh, household activity as being uh, one of the primary ways of getting activity back into life, because I don't think people are going to get rid of their washing machines so that we can you know, start doing this again. I just don't see that happening. Um, 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 so we're looking at mainly leisure and transportation as ways of increasing uh, physical activity. And we talk about activity-friendly environments, which are simply places that make it easy to choose to be physically active for any purpose. And uh, I want to start now with uh, uh, 
talking about uh, just a couple of strategies um, that seem to be effective for promoting activity through school and, uh, and thinking really about policy and environmental change. And I think of physical education as driven by policy and providing an environment for kids to be active. And so here is a, uh, a wonderful physical education class where uh, the kids are moving, uh, they have uh, equipment, they're, they're learning skills, and there's a, a, a very engaged teacher over here. Now, uh, that's the good news. The bad news is I had to go to Japan to find this. Uh, this PE, because uh, even in California, you think, okay, everything is going to be really nice and sunshiny and bright, but you know, uh, even in a wonderful school district, one of the highest achieving school districts, this is what we find going on in physical education. And I say it's not physical because they're not moving, and it's not education because they're not even paying attention. These yeah. these girls here. <laughs> Uh, and look at the teacher, look at the contrast. She hasn't even put her purse down, okay? She's not, she's not dressed for activity, and, uh, and, this is, and you got one ball for the whole class, so how good are you gonna get at basketball if every day you can try two shots? And look at this, this girl is gonna get bonked on the head by this, <laughs> by this ball. So, you know, PE is, is a wonderful resource that's incredibly underutilized. And so um, in the late 1980s, um, uh, a, a couple of uh, major studies were done to try to fix this situation. One of them was CATCH, um, huge study, heart health program at 96 elementary schools in four states. Enhanced physical education was part of this, as well as health education, food service changes, and a family intervention. Uh, sorry for the bad slide, but basically what you see here in moderate to vigorous uh, physical activity directly observed during PE classes was that uh, the intervention schools uh, uh, after the teachers were trained immediately increased, continued to get better, and maintained uh, over six semesters. The controls didn't really change, but over time you know, they got a little better, but there was always this difference here. So um, changed uh, 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 more, a uh, higher percentage of class time in, in physical activity. And I'll mention our SPARK, uh, SPARK program, uh, which was a, had a similar goal of improving uh, physical education, getting kids more active, et cetera. And, um, and so uh, emphasized uh, movement for all kids, not just the ones who were already skilled, and uh, improving sports skills. And we also had a self-management class, or uh, teaching behavior change skills, and teaching goal setting, and involving families and getting kids active outside of school. Um, and uh, we, we taught, um, train, we trained classroom teachers who had never been trained in PE before to improve their PE, and uh, we had a physical education specialist. And so one of the, the main, um, uh, we also directly observe PE classes. One of the main things that we found was that the controls, the blue bars, um, uh, just didn't do PE. They were required to uh, by state law, but they just ignored that. So they only came out uh, a total of 30 minutes per week you know, of going for PE class. When we train the teachers in the yellow bars, they at least came out more often. They doubled that to about 65 minutes, and then our PE specialist up to about 80 minutes. And you see, we saw comparable increases in moderate to vigorous physical activity, and a little bit of increase in, uh, in high, high activity. So we, we got kids more active. We also found that in, in all outcomes, physical education specialists were better than trained classroom teachers who were consistently better than controls. And we looked at a variety of outcomes. Improved quality of instruction, actively instructing. I showed you the increased physical activity. We found, especially for girls, improved cardiorespiratory fitness and uh, muscular fitness. Um, improved sports skills which you want to teach in uh, physical education. And maybe uh, two of the, the most important outcomes were a positive impact on academic achievement, which is all the schools care about. Um, so we have burst the myth 
that, oh no, we don't have time for PE because we have to improve our, our academic achievement scores. So what we showed is you do not have to sacrifice the children's health for their academic achievement. And we documented that the kids really liked this kind of PE, where they're active and they're learning things. So um, here's, here is something that could be relatively easily changed by policy. And now we have evidence-based PE programs for elementary school, catch and spark, for middle school, we did a study in middle school, and for high school. There was a recently published study from Russ Pate's group in uh, South Carolina about an effective program for uh, high school. So we know what to do. The policies do not support adoption and implementation of evidence-based programs. They don't require, um, uh, most states have some kind of requirements for minutes of PE. Well, most of those minutes of PE are not active. So um, uh, I don't know of a single state that has adopted the Healthy People 2010 objective of at least 50% of class time being uh, in physical activity. I think that should be um, a goal for health professionals to make that a requirement uh, for PE. So. Uh, now, I just want to uh, mention from our uh, middle school study that we did a few years ago, um, a, uh, how you, uh, some uh, options for uh, ensuring environments in schools are set up to encourage physical activity. So again, we went out on, into the school grounds and observed physical activity um, uh, in every environment where they could be active, playgrounds, fields, uh, uh, gymnasiums, and at times when the kids could choose to be active or not, before school, after lunch, and after school. And, he, and, and we observed characteristics of the environments. And uh, the, the outcome here is the percent of children who were physically, uh, who were attending school that day that were active in these settings. And so we, uh, we tried to explain the, this level of activity um, by, only by the social and physical environment. And so here we see the significant factors, the size of the area, so like a playing field, the number of improvements. So improvements are things like a basketball goal, a soccer goal, markings on the playground, um, and then whether they were supervised or organized, uh, the type of area, whether there was equipment available. And then we, we had these, uh, these a priori, I will uh, mention, um, uh, interactions. And uh, here, so this is the data for girls. And just by our observations of the social and physical environment, we explained 42% of the variance in uh, these girls' physical activity at times and places where they could choose to be active or not. For boys, we explained 60% uh, of the variance. Uh, to me, these were shockingly high numbers. Um, so what does that say? It says that just by um, providing places, uh, suitable places to play, by providing supervision and equipment, uh, you can stimulate uh, activity in these kids. And let me just show you one um, of the uh, interactions as an example. This is supervision, high or low, and this is uh, the two lines are improvements high and low. So you can see if you have low supervision and low improvements, you get very, very low uh, activity levels. If you have both of those, uh, you get much better. So I think this is uh, data showing simple things that you can do um, uh, to uh, improve activity at school outside of physical education, so throughout the school day. Uh, going the wrong way. Okay, and, and just one other thing like this. Uh, uh, Stratton has done some very interesting studies in the UK showing that simple playground markings, what can be cheaper as an intervention than painting on the, the, the playground? And you see an example here. Stimulated uh, 18 minutes a day of physical activity more than if they didn't have the uh, the markings and and those those effects they they've tested them up to six months and two years and as long as the markings are there the kids are going to play this is this is so easy 
evidence-based. So these things should be everywhere. And a, a, a study in Belgium showed just putting out equipment at recess increased physical activity. So at school, there are lots of things you can do by policy to, uh, to improve P, uh, physical activity, and it doesn't have to cost very much. Oops. Okay. Uh, all right, now we're going to move to school to the recreation environment. So here's a park. This is uh, Boston Common. Uh, one of the things that we found a long time ago in, in uh, several studies of young people, uh, young children, like preschool children, is we, we uh, again, we believe in observation because you can't ask young children, how many minutes a day do you exercise? Can't do it. So you got to follow them around or put accelerometers. So we followed them around so we could see where are they being active, with whom, that sort of thing. And we found that there were dramatic differences um, when kids were indoors versus outdoors. And, uh, uh, and in fact, in one of, in our study, the correlation was, was over 0.7. And I don't think I've ever had a correlation in any of my studies this high. Now, in physiology, you get these kind of things all the time. In behavior, we don't. Um, so, uh, you know, so children are much more active outdoors. These are young children, right? So, of course, they love to play. And what happens when they come indoors? They hear the mantra, please sit down and be quiet. And, of course, they do uh, because we make them. So, uh, um, so if we provide outdoor spaces for children and leave them alone, for a while, they will be active. The problem is we don't do that. We keep them inside where it's safe, but you know, we teach them uh, uh, to you know, uh, amuse themselves with electronics, and uh, of course they get very good at that. Now the challenge is uh, not only to have places outdoors where kids can be active, but safe places. And that's much easier uh, said than done. But, you know, if we want kids to be active, this is what we have to do. Because uh, it's very unlikely they're going to be sufficiently active indoors. And uh, this, is, this is a little literature review um, uh, and, uh, uh, that we wrote up for the President's Council for Physical Fitness and Sports. This is, uh, you can download this from my uh, website or the physical, uh, President's Council website. Uh, it's, a, it's a very simple introduction to some of these issues. And so uh, what we have done here is a, um, a simple summary of the evidence uh, looking at built environment attributes and how they're related to either active transportation or active recreation. So first, let's look at the recreation. Interestingly, um, a, a, a small number of studies have found that uh, kids that live in walkable neighborhoods where you can walk to destinations, they're kind of built for pedestrians um, uh, with mixed land use, uh, connected streets, and a higher density, that kids are, do more total activity uh, when they are in those areas. Um, and uh, sidewalks. Well, it's interesting that sidewalks are related to both uh, 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 recreation and transportation activity. But here's, here's the big winner for kids. Uh, proximity to places where they can be active. Parks, trails, or private facilities like dance studios, martial arts, those kind of places. Um, of uh, quite a few studies and quite consistent relationships to physical activity. I'll show you a couple of examples of those. And it's not just that there are facilities, but they have to be nice. You know, a, a rundown, rat infested, gang infested park is not the same as a good park, all right? So the aesthetics need to be, uh, need to be good. Um, so, um, so there's, there's evidence, there's consistent evidence, um, and uh, you know, to me, there's enough to act on. Um, that a, a community is not a community without a good park. And kid, you know, the basic idea here, kids need places to play because they can't play indoors and not every child has a, has a backyard or a, a, a playground in their apartment common area, that sort of thing. So this has to be, I think, one of the priorities for uh, obesity prevention and physical activity promotion in youth. So let me, let me just uh, give you this um, one study. Now this is a, a really good uh, 
paper. This is a, a large, very large national study um, uh, that Penny Gordon Larson did. Um, and uh, you, it's, you can't see it too well here, maybe. But uh, down here is the number of physical, act, uh, physical facilities, uh, recreational facilities, by census block group. So that's a, a piece of a census tract. And uh, you see they're arrayed there. And uh, on this axis, y-axis, is the um, uh, odds ratio um, for um, uh, uh, meeting physical activity guidelines. This is self-reported kind of bouts of uh, meeting, meeting guidelines for physical activity. So for the physical activity, you see, um, uh, so zero uh, facilities is, uh, uh, is one. And then the more facilities that are in the block group, uh, the more uh, likely kids are to be active. Uh, and, and if you have seven facilities, up to more than 25% increased odds ratio. And it, uh, simultaneously, this is the risk of being overweight. And so uh, if you have zero facilities, that's set at one. And if you have up to seven facilities, it's, it's about, uh, it's an odds ratio of, of less than 0.75, so uh, a 25% reduction in risk there uh, in, in percent overweight. So uh, to me, that's pretty compelling uh, evidence and a, a good example of a, a study. And this is national study, and this is uh, adolescence. So um, I think that's an important one. Now, the, the, the bad news is that there are disparities in access to recreation facilities. And uh, hopefully you can read the types of facilities here. Um, and with all facilities, um, basically what this says is that um, uh, the higher income uh, people have twice as many facilities available. Right? So an odds ratio of having, uh, having you know, one additional facility. And you know, regardless of uh, of type of facility, whether it's a park, um, any kind of public facility, or a YMCA, or any kind of instruction like dance or martial arts, um, higher income uh, 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 children have better access to them, public or private, free or pay. So I think that is something um, uh, given the disparities, maybe not so much in physical activity, but certainly in obesity, with uh, higher rates of obesity in minority populations and in low-income populations, re re reducing these disparities has to be uh, one of our goals. OK, now, um, one of the things, oddly, that we don't know much about in physical activity is where do children do it? Where are they active? So uh, we, we, people haven't thought to study that. We studied it a few years ago in our middle school study and found that, in fact, kids are active, or report being active, in a wide variety of locations. Commercial facilities, uh, at school on the weekend, at a public recreation center, after school, at parks. But look at the most common place that kids are active in their neighborhood. So um, in the history of uh, studying physical activity and health, we've really only looked at parks and, and those kind of facilities. And we never thought to actually study the neighborhood. Well, now we are doing that. And let me give you um, uh, an overview of the literature in this area. And so now we start talking again about walkable neighborhoods. And there's kind of these two uh, concepts, underlying concepts for walkability. One is proximity. Um, are there places to walk to from your home? Whether it's a, a, a store or a school or a, uh, or a park. And then connectivity. Are there safe and direct ways to make the trip? So the more connected the streets are, the more direct your trip. Um, so if, you, if you're on a uh, living in a, a kind of a grid pattern uh, neighborhood, uh, you, can, you can have many choices of how you get from place to place. But in most areas of the country, um, by law, most new developments are, uh, violate these principles. They require, by zoning regulation, separation of uses. Houses have to be here, 
Stores have to be here. You know, uh, office space has to be here. Manufacturing is somewhere else. So by design, um, uh, the places where you want to go are put out of walking distance. And by happenstance, if you maybe live on the edge of the residential area close to a store, uh, they make sure to design the streets that are so circuitous, you know, in the lo lollipops and loops and um, cul-de-sacs, that you are prevented from walking there, right? So they have two ways of reducing your physical activity level, by putting things far away, and even if they're close, making sure you can't get there. Okay, so here's a, here's a very walkable place, and uh, uh, I w it was pointed out to me that you have a pedestrian and bus only uh, street correct connecting directly to the Capitol. So this is very good. I want to take another look at that because um, there's very few examples of pedestrian streets in the United States. In Europe, it's required. You have to have it. So, and look what happens when you build a place for pedestrians. They do come. All right? And here's a place, if you build a place for cars, well, the pedestrians stay away. All right? So more, more suburban. OK, now, um, <clears throat> uh, for those of you who are not sure what this is, these are children walking to school. All right? We don't see that very much anymore. Um, and obviously, walking, cycling to school can contribute to physical activity on a daily basis. Um, as far as we can tell, it's decreased, you know, 40% from the 70s to the 90s. Current rates, depending on the study, are from 5 to 14%. That is very low. That is very low percents. Uh, there are a couple of, um, I won't say great evaluations, but evaluations nonetheless of walk to school programs. In Marin County, uh, it was a, a combination of, of, of improving crosswalks and things and then promoting walking to school. And walking and biking improved dramatically. Um, and in a, another study uh, in, in California, um, uh, they studied uh, 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 improvements like putting in sidewalks, putting in crosswalks, um, calming traffic, reducing the speed of traffic. And the children who uh, would, might pass by those improvements on their way to school, 16% of those said they increased their activity. But if the kids came from the other direction and they didn't uh, uh, pass by these improvements, only 40% of those increased their walking. After, uh, after those improvements. So we have a little bit of uh, evidence that you can, these interventions uh, to uh, promote uh, walking to school can be effective. Um, uh, the neighborhood design matters for uh, active commuting to school. This is one of our studies. We found that in high walkable neighborhoods, 25% uh, uh, of kids uh, walked or biked. In low walkable suburban neighborhoods, only 11%. And uh, probably a lot of that had to do with the distance to schools, because in the suburbs, the kids are going to live farther away. But another thing that we found that was somewhat surprising is that uh, in, the, in the suburban, low walkable neighborhoods, the parent concerns about safety for walking to school were much higher than in the high walkable neighborhoods. And what were their concerns about? It wasn't so much about uh, abductions. It was about traffic. OK, so here's an interesting thing. A lot, uh, why do a lot of families go move to the suburbs? Because it's going to be better for their children. But then, because of the setup of the suburbs, everybody's driving everywhere. So when they get there, they actually have more concerns about traffic um, than uh, uh, the, the people in walkable neighborhoods. So I think that's, a, that's an interesting lesson. Uh, all right, so here's an example. There's now quite a few, uh, you know, I'd say a handful of studies showing that kids that live in walkable neighborhoods that we know are, are promote uh, uh, adults' activity also seem to be good for adolescents. And here's a study we did, very small, only 100 adolescents. But we had objective measures of walkability, and we had objective measures of physical activity. And so we, we found, and uh, well, we also had objective measures of distance to recreational facilities. So in this study, recreational facilities was not significant. 
but uh, the walkability of the neighborhood was, and explained 5% of the variance in total objectively measured activity. And you'd say, well, 5%, well, that's not very much, but that's how much variance gender explained, and that's the, the most uh, consistent uh, 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 predictor of, of activity, and also ethnicity. So, uh, so we think, well, it's not the whole picture, but it's an important part of the picture. And a another study uh, that we did, part of our PACE research, this was 800 adolescents, also activity measured objectively and uh, environment me measured objectively, and a, a little bit less, less uh, clear, but with girls, activity was related to a measure of uh, walkability. Um, here it was also uh, related to uh, recreation facilities. Park acreage, uh, a significant correlation. Access to recreational facilities uh, also. But negatively related to connectivity. So that means that, the, let's say, if the kids were in a, uh, a cul-de-sac area, they might be more active, at least the girls. And so, uh, so in fact, uh, they may be using cul-de-sacs as play areas. And in boys, there was a little less evidence, but uh, a little bit of evidence that it was related to, uh, uh, to walkability. Uh, and uh, just to show you that you can, you can um, be a, a little more aggressive about creating environments that promote kids' activity, this is called uh, a home zone. And uh, this is in Norway. And uh, this is a sign that indicates a home zone that's mainly for people and in, including promoting kids' activity, and secondarily for cars. So you see there's this one narrow lane that cars can go by, but they're using most of the street for pedestrian. You see a bike parked there, and a play area for kids instead of the street. So this is a way to prioritize um, creating a place where kids can play in a densely populated area where you don't have big parks. Right? So if, you, if kids' health is your priority in designing neighborhoods, you can do it so as to promote kids' health. Uh, it may slow down the cars a bit, but you know, they, can, they can still get by. So we need to think a little more boldly uh, than we have uh, to date. Uh, all right, now uh, just one, uh, one or two minutes. I just want to tell you about the Active Living Research Program uh, very briefly. Um, we have three goals uh, uh, that we do with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. One is to establish a strong research base to teach us more about how we can uh, develop policies and design environments that promote uh, physical activity. Um, uh, we started in 2001 and uh, with a $12.5 million research uh, budget. Uh, we have uh, now given that out. Um, and uh, about 100 grants, not all of them with youth, um, but uh, we're really building the evidence on environment and policy and physical activity. We were just renewed for another five years, um, and uh, we uh, have a bigger research budget of $15.5 million. And uh, the focus now is on uh, preventing childhood obesity. So we're trying to learn how we can uh, design activity-friendly environments that are relevant for youth with a focus on um, uh, the children at highest risk for uh, uh, obesity, which of course are um, minority populations and uh, low-income communities. Um, and uh, we're building a transdisciplinary field of researchers. And so a lot of different uh, uh, groups involved in this research, many of whom have never really been involved in uh, uh, health research before. And we're uh, very specifically uh, and explicitly using the research to inform policy. And so at the, the, the back of the, uh, the room, hopefully you picked up uh, the research summary, uh, Designing for Active Living Among Children. And that's uh, meant to summarize the research for policymakers, for advocates, to help move to educate uh, people who are making decisions about what evidence-based practices might be.
And uh, just a few things about active living research. We have a conference every year um, uh, uh, bringing in all these different disciplines, which is really uh, an exciting event. This year, for the first time, it's going to be in Washington, D.C., with the theme of connecting researchers to policymakers. So we're bringing in not only people from uh, Congress and staff of Congress, but advocacy groups and uh, others who use research. From all of our slides, the, uh, from all of our conferences, the slides are online uh, from just about every presentation. Uh, each year, we uh, develop a, a journal issue uh, with the best research that's submitted to, uh, uh, to the uh, conference, and those are online, free access. Um, uh, our website has a tremendous amount of information um, about this, including um, uh, more uh, research summaries and research briefs, so I encourage you to go there. Um, we did 11 case studies of active living policies, and we published those in Planning Magazine that go to 40,000 planners all across the country. Those are on our website. One of the, one of the case studies is about a, uh, a kind of a, a zoning reform evaluation in uh, Wisconsin, so you should read that. And we're having our next call for proposals. It's going to be about uh, childhood uh, obesity prevention. Hopefully, will come out in March, maybe April of this year. So, uh, take a watch our website for that. So, I think uh, I think based on that, I want to close by saying, your health professionals. So, there's a number of things that you can do to promote activity. Uh, and activity-friendly environments and reduce obesity. One is, is to uh, implement screening prevention and treatment strategies in your practices as outlined in uh, new guidelines recently published in pediatrics. Um, and the second is, and I think personally this is even going to be more effective for you, to become an advocate. Put, to, uh, uh, put aside a little bit of time every couple of months to advocate for better school environments and policies, for better uh, parks, um, for community organizations to be more effective in promoting youth activity, and for uh, better urban design and transportation policies to provide for uh, active living uh, environments. Because your credibility uh, across the community and with policymakers can really make a big difference. So with that, I will thank you and see if we have uh, some questions and discussion. Thank you.